welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, if you're joining us live, thank you for taking time out of your Monday and joining us. If you're watching on the replay, thanks for watching as well. Uh, before we introduce our guests that we're going to go ahead and interview, uh, please keep in mind these rules for the stream. Please don't spam in the chat. If you have a question, put a cue in front of your question so I can easily pick it out. And then uh, also super chats get priority. So if you want to jump the line, go ahead and throw a super chat into the chat and we'll answer your question as well. You can also find uh, links for our guests in the description of the video. All right. So let me go ahead and introduce our guest. Our guest today has a job as an ICS OT cybersecurity manager who's passionate about helping organizations solve their most challenging industrial security problems. He aims to marry practical engineering concepts with real world cybersecurity experience to defend against emerging threats. He gets his greatest occupational and personal fulfillment from protecting people and organizations for the purpose of creating a safer digital world. Let's go ahead and welcome Gabriel or you might also know him from his YouTube channel, Struggle Security. Hey. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> hello, hello. It's so funny, as you were reading the description, I'm like, I heard that somewhere before. It's actually the thing on my LinkedIn channel, and I'm like, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to have you. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people are interested in this stream because it's, um, you know, you work in an area that is not necessarily the standard or typical uh, area for cybersecurity. I think a lot yep. of people think of that, um, you know, traditional enterprise environment as where mm -hmm. they're going to go. They want to deal with regular computers and all this fancy right. stuff. And uh, so I'm really interested to dive into it and really learn about it myself, too, because I don't know a ton about it either. Sure. Um, so I think uh, the first thing that I want to go ahead and do is really just kind of get um, you know a background about you, kind of how you found cybersecurity, and mm -hmm. really just IT in general, and how you kind of fell into uh, into where you're at now. Absolutely. Uh, so where do you want me to start? You want me to start just how I got into and kind of my background, or where uh, do you want me to start? Yeah, I mean, really, kind of just yeah. wherever you thought um, you mm -hmm. know you thought about going that direction. Absolutely. So I think that. A lot of my, I guess, STEM, right, science, technology, engineering, mathematics kind of background comes from um, my, my undergrad, really. So I majored in electrical engineering, right? So you think of electrical engineering and you think of information technology, you don't automatically, I guess, put those two together. It's because they're very and vastly different. So um, as I was going through school, I was learning physics, I was learning calculus, I was learning, especially electrical engineering, electromagnetism and power systems, right? A lot of math and science involved and electricity and theory, but um, I didn't really have a good introduction to IT as an, as an undergrad. So when I graduated from, from, from school with my bachelor's in electrical engineering, I went into the automotive field where um, it was cool, right? I was what you call like an, a wire harness design engineer uh, for, Ford, for Ford Motor Company. So I was there and we dealt with the electrical distribution, right? The wiring harness inside of the vehicles, the electrical distribution to make sure that what we designed there in Michigan is where I'm originally from, is what they were putting inside of the vehicles um, as it was going down the line. I did that for probably about a year and a half because I was learning, I was noticing I wasn't learning a whole lot. So I jumped into the nuclear field, and that was actually how I got into cybersecurity and IT as a whole, because I was working for a nuclear plant where electrical engineers and mechanical engineers very commonly go and work for nuclear plants. It's like nuclear engineers, nuclear instrumentation and control engineers. Um, so I was working there, but then Stuxnet happened. And if you're familiar with Stuxnet, right, it's a, it's, it was a, a, some malware in the Middle Eastern nuclear facility that caused shockwaves across the nuclear industry and cybersecurity as a whole. So then my plant was implementing so much cybersecurity guidance based upon Stuxnet. So then I was thrust into cybersecurity and IT from that experience. So that's how I got my introduction is because of Stuxnet. Stuxnet changed my life. I need to make a hashtag about that. <laughs> that's quite the uh, way to break into it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, cool, yeah. Disaster and then straight into a new field. <laughs> absolutely, right? I, I, I mean, that's how it goes these, these, these days, for sure. That's not always a bad thing, right? Job security, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, given that you work with a lot of, you know, the power plants and these ICS mm -hmm. systems, 
you know, what are things that um, that you would say are unique to that kind of environment that you see that maybe right. when you go to like a conference or something like that, that other people don't see? Yeah. So a lot of times that comes in the form of, and this is a big, con- I wouldn't say a big conversation for us ICS OT folk. We're like, oh, we hear this so often. It's like IT OT convergence, right? So IT stands for information technology and OT stands for operational technology. And many times people are trying to understand the differences between the environments in order to be able to protect those, protect OT, OT, right? And I think that a lot of times um, when you're looking at the differences or you're looking for the uniqueness of ICS and OT, um, I think one asset comes into mind, right? Something that is a big distinguisher between the two environments. And it's that of one asset is called a PLC. It's called a programmable logic controller. And it's pretty much a device to really boil it down and, and simplify it. It's a device that changes digital inputs into physical out, output. And that physical output can look in a, a lot of different ways. It can look like a valve being opened in the, in, in the chemical facility. It can look like um, re- recirculation pumps within a nuclear plant pumping water into a reactor to cool it down. It can also look like um, like with a building management system, turning lights on and off or HVAC system on and off for changing the, the levels. Um, I think that's one of the heaviest, heaviest distinguishers between IT and OT is like a PLC or just the overall idea that digital turns into physical really, really quickly. OK, so I guess a follow up question to that mm-hmm. is you know, obviously a lot of the um, like cybersecurity training and stuff that's out Mm -hmm. there, you know, it's very focused on training you for computers and how to secure that stuff. So is there kind of courses for that or how did you go about learning all that? So I went about learning it from being in the industry, right? So I was, so within a nuclear plant, I had one project that, that I was responsible for and it was called the PMMD program, the Portable Media and Mobile Device Program. This is anytime some type of CD or USB drive or a disk drive, anything was brought into the plant, it needed to go through our program before it touched any plant assets, any plant systems, any plant networks. So that was something that made me learn very quickly is that we needed to protect things that touched our ICS and OT assets. But when you ask about training, there are some trainings out, out there. Um, I previously worked for an organization called Mandiant, um, back when they were Mandiant FireEye. Um, and Mandiant offers training courses. They have ones called Fundamentals of ICS Cybersecurity. They have a course, I think it's several thousand dollars or, or so. It can be kind of expensive. Um, SANS organization, GX SANS, they have a cor- several courses, really. They have one for more of like the introductory information about ICS and OT security. It's called the GICSP um, certification. That's that's one. I've been through that one. That one's very expensive. It can be anywhere from seven to eight thousand dollars. But otherwise, you see some online free stuff through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but it's not a whole lot of resources out there that give trainings for industrial um, and OT cybersecurity. So Hopefully would, that answers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. um, I guess kind of as you were coming up, um, yep. <clears throat> did a lot of this training exist or is this kind of like newer stuff that um, has kind of just come out as it's evolved? Yeah, it's it's more newer stuff, <clears throat> right? Because a lot of times individuals who will be responsible for cybersecurity. So think of a plant environment, like a plant, like whether it's like an industrial uh, plant environment or a warehouse or um, I guess some type of, environment where there's conveyor belts, many times the people that's responsible for cybersecurity in those environments are whether it's the plant managers or uh, process engineers or operational engineers or um, individuals who are not um, traditionally have an IT background. So when you talk about how to get trained up on these things, these individuals are the ones responsible and they don't traditionally have a background in cybersecurity or IT. So many times they learn by doing, they learn by sometimes even vendors, right? So there's certain vendors like Siemens, ABB, they will help to try to train you up or Emerson, they'll, they'll try to tell you about the security features of your assets. 
But many times you just have to like learn by doing or regulatory, right? Because there are regulatory bodies within the U.S., like the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or um, the NERC SIP. I forget the, the, the acronym name, but they put out cybersecurity guidance for these different industrial environments. So I would say regulatory and also just overall just doing it within the field, but not a lot of training resources out there for it, or at least free or inexpensive. So. Okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, for people looking to get into uh, like ICS and OT cybersecurity or that are mm -hmm. thinking about it and kind of thinking, you know, from a, from a, a top level perspective, what kind right. of skills uh, do you think are really important for them to develop since there isn't yeah. a ton of training or at least, you know, affordable training for people that aren't, um, you know, that don't have a lot of budget to, to put into it? Right. I would say one is that one thing that would be very important is kind of learning how to immerse yourself into some of the talking heads or not talking heads, but more of the thought thought leaders. So a gentleman, his name is Rob Lee, right? His at Rob, Rob Lee, he's the CEO of a company called Dragos. And Dragos is an industrial ICS OT security company. He tweets and puts out all types of information. He even wrote a blog talking about how to get into cyber security or ICS and OT cybersecurity. I can provide you with that link so you can put it in the, in the description section. But that blog kind of really steps you through some of the things to understand. I think also having some of those IT um, type of backgrounds too. So I think networking is something that's huge within ICS and OT cybersecurity. Because in many cases, um, so right, getting a little bit more shop talk as a concern cybersecurity, Many devices um, within IT, they have things like EDR, right? Endpoint detection and response, or they'll have, or they'll be having some type of SIM or even connection to the cloud. In ICS and OT, that a lot of that doesn't exist. So many times when you're looking for indicators of compromise, when you're looking for malicious act activity, many times we have to rely on what's happening from a network perspective. So we're looking for data ex exfiltration lateral movement and all these different things. So having a strong networking background, TCP IP, packet analysis, those type of things are just, just different protocols. It's very important to um, understanding ICS and OT cybersecurity. So those are some of those backgrounds or, or some of those things that I think are important. Okay, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So another question too that I have is, um, you know, I know a lot of, um, like organizations and entities and things like that that are in mm -hmm. kind of these critical infrastructure type environments. Um, yep. You know, a lot of these systems hang around for a while. Yeah. Um, so I guess, um, mm -hmm. you know, what uh, kind of like operating systems or things like that, because I know there's a lot of like legacy stuff that kind of lingers yeah. around, um, but like what kind of stuff as far as that should people just be aware of? Because I know a lot of people that are kind of mm -hmm. new to cybersecurity, you know, they might not even know what Windows XP is. <laughs> like... Listen, yes, yeah. So that's a big challenge with an ICS and OT cybersecurity. So you're speaking about legacy systems. So when you say, so like industrial environments, there are different devices and assets that just like you say, they stay in, they stay commissioned or they deploy for a long periods of time. So you think of like a turbine, right? An electrical turbine, which changes, um, it, it pretty much helps to produce electricity. I don't want to go into the details about it, but yeah, yeah. No, uh, don't get in uh, trouble. <laughs> right. So your so your goal, so they put and install turbines and they mm -hmm. they stay in there for 15 or 20 years. All right. So when they installed install them and put them into, into service, many times they're aligned with software that um, is 15 or 20 years previous to what is now. So you're talking about Windows XP, you're talking about Windows NT, you talk about Windows server 2008 r2 or something right old operating systems that are no longer supported and it's because the equipment is still old so in order to support the equipment you need to also have those older and antiquated operating systems in order to um, keep those things running and that's another thing right because one of the principles in cybersecurity is like right the cia triad that's probably one of the first things that you learn confidentiality integrity and availability um, in many other in environments like financial, right? You want your confidentiality. You don't want anybody getting to your, your customer's social security numbers, or bank account numbers, all this information. But in ICS and OT, that's not that important, right? The thing that's most important is that availability because you think of a, your electrical utility organization. They need to continually be able to pump electricity 
into your houses so that you can charge your iPhones and your, <laughs> and your computers. So availability of that service is so much more important. So they're not changing out operating systems. They're not changing a whole bunch of things. They want things to work and continually provide their service to the world. So that's another one of those differences there. So hopefully I answered the, the question. No, yeah, yeah, just... for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's definitely a good point for yep. people that are newer to the industry is mm -hmm. that, you know, within cybersecurity, it's a lot of tailoring kind of to the, um, the application of the security. So Absolutely. You know, the industry matters. Um, you know, who the threat actors are that might try to attack you or try mm -hmm. to get your data. Um, yep. You know, not, not everybody is extremely concerned with confidentiality or availability or integrity. It's going to mm -hmm. vary. And, um, you know, and a lot of my jobs, I've dealt a lot with the NIST risk management framework. Oh, and okay. so that is, you know, one of those frameworks that is very much a tailoring exercise. Mm. Um, because, you know, you have all these controls that you could theoretically put into place, right. but some of them are not, you know, they, they don't matter. They don't make right. sense for the environment. High, medium, lows. That's what I remember. High, medium, lows, yeah. you assign them. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, and it just, it makes me think about when I first started, you know, you, you learn, you know, mm -hmm. this all should be secure. Do all this, yeah. do all this. It's like, well, it depends. Everybody's favorite yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, and it also re reminds me of something like I know that. Um, so I was born and raised and grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Right. So one thing that happened and it never happened as I was growing up, but kind of more into my adulthood when I was living with my mom. What happened was, is that um, someone had broke into our home. Right. They broke into our home and they stole like some computers and some stuff. Right. Stuff that's replaceable. But um, it was so interesting because my mom was like, we need to get the best security system. We need to put the locks on all, all, all of the doors. It was almost like there, she was creating a prison, right? And I think that that's one thing that's, that, that, that we need to think about as cybersecurity practitioners is are we creating a prison um, around our assets? Because at times people can't access them. People can't at times, people can't do their jobs because there's so many cybersecurity controls that are implemented that might not even be necessary to the production of whatever you're trying to do within that business environment. And I just remember, like, she used to just put locks, lock, lock the door, two, three, four, five locks. I'm like, no, that's not right. So applying to what you're saying, right, you don't need to apply all of the controls. <laughs> All of the controls applied does not equal security because sometimes all the controls applied can equal prison, right? So yeah, it's kind of one point I want to bring up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, even in my time in cybersecurity, I mean, I, I've seen mm -hmm. you know several kind of shifts in mindsets, um, mm -hmm. just how to approach you know cybersecurity. Like when yeah. I first got into it, um, you know, I was dealing with other kind of regulations, and then it turned into mm -hmm. NIST risk management framework. And, um, you know, zero trust is really popular and kind of oh, yeah. uh, on the upcoming uh, for a lot of companies. And if people aren't familiar with what zero trust is, basically it's the idea that, um, you know, traditionally we used to really rely on our perimeter defenses to keep people out. And mm -hmm. we're assuming that nobody ever gets in. That never happens, right? Right. And uh, so with zero trust, it's this idea that you're assuming that somebody is already in your network. And so it's it's kind of a... It's a big shift in the mindset of how things have been traditionally, but Absolutely. it's just you know another example of what happens in this field. Things change a lot, and the more that you can, yep, zero trust stigs, yep. Oh man, and, uh... that's my buddy Cyber, but <laughs> that's my buddy Black Ops. He loves stigs. Ah, I used to stig a bit, and I just don't like it at all. I was saying, yeah, stigs it's a very are very meticulous uh... process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you guys aren't familiar with what STIGs are, they're basically um, technical requirements that um, the government puts on to systems. So different configurations or controls and things like that. Basically, you know, risk management framework or NIST uh, special publication 830, uh, 853. Yep. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and shift gears and let's talk a little bit about YouTube. So, you know, definitely uh, on a little bit of the newer side as far as YouTube uh, creators, um, one of the things that, um, that actually stuck out for me, so I, I don't even remember what video I stumbled across when I first saw your channel, 
but um, you know, I, I started seeing uh, thumbnails and I liked the way that you put your video together and edit it yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, this guy has done it before. I'm like, no, this is, no. This is kind of, uh, it's better <laughs> than the, the standard uh, newbie. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, mm -hmm. it just really stuck out, uh, stuck out in my head. Oh, thank um, you, man. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess one question for me is, you know, what really made you want to start doing YouTube? Like what, what mm -hmm. got you into it? What was that, that uh, pushing point? I think that the best, the reason why is exactly the people who are in the chat right now. Like my brothers, like Keep It Techie and Professor Black Ops and other content creators. They, like I would always contribute to their platform. So I would come up on the panels, right? You know, you can drop the link for stream for, for StreamYard and they would always have me come up, we would have discussions about cybersecurity and what I was doing, what they were doing. And they really were pushing me. It's like, listen, you need to make your own content, right? You are doing, you very much so help to contribute to ours, but it's your time to kind of step out and do it yourself. So I think other larger and people who are more of those OG content creators, they pushed me to do it. So I blame, I thank them and blame them at the same time. So those guys. <laughs> So I yeah. guess, um, you know, mm -hmm. through that whole journey uh, so far, uh, and his um, his channel is in the, uh, the video title and the description too. So if you want to mm -hmm. check out his stuff, um, but, you know, throughout this journey so far, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are some things that you've learned? Maybe some yeah. uh, common themes that you've seen with people that have, you know, hit you up for advice? Yeah, I think the major things that I've learned is that, um, Listen to the, the comment section and the chat room for when people are making suggestions, telling you what they want to hear. I think that's been one of my major things is that I would literally ask, like someone would leave a comment. I'd say, I would say, oh, thanks for the feedback. Is there anything that you want to hear or you want to see? And I would take several of those suggestions and put it to whatever list of uh, content that I'm looking to produce. Um, and I think that that's one thing, right? Providing that service is I think the major thing because um, really my channel is very focused on individuals who are newer or transitioning into cybersecurity. It's not really like, like very advanced topics. It can be for some, for some people, but it's very much so for those who are newer or transitioning into cybersecurity and really going and really making struggling, like normalizing, right? My title is normalizing struggling in cybersecurity. I say that over and over because I know I've struggled in many places. So one, listening to the people and two, sticking with um, kind of the content and the group of people that I'm trying to reach and communicate to. So those are kind of two of the things that I've, that I've been learning. And it's yeah. still new, just like you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> it's still new. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think those are definitely some common things, you know, that we've mm -hmm. all kind of gone through. Um, you know, everybody in their career, whatever career it is, struggles in some fashion. Yep. I think in cybersecurity, a lot of times, it's um, not always having that direction or idea of where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with all the certifications, it's like, I, I don't know what to study. <laughs> oh, man, I'm telling you. Even now, like I, like, like, I don't know, like, do you run into that now? I still run into that where I'm like, yeah. there's so many things to go into. Do I want to start my, my cloud security journey? Do I want to dig down deeper into DFIR for my particular thing? Too? Am I looking to make a new tool for ICS and OT cybers? Like I have so many different things that I'm looking at getting into even outside of work, right? So I still struggle with like, what am I going to study or what I'm going to dig and drill down into? So... Yeah, I, don't I, think, know. <laughs> I think as you kind of progress, it gets um, mm -hmm. uh, it happens even more because uh, personally, I think, especially like when you're initially starting out, I mean, even though mm -hmm. there isn't always this like clearly displayed path, I mean, I even put an ebook on my website where I mm -hmm. give a roadmap of certifications and skills to get because it, uh, frankly, especially when you're starting out, a lot of the stuff, it is pretty clear cut. You should yeah. know about operating systems. You should know about networks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's all these kind of baseline skills that you should know because everything ends up building on top of that. And then when you start learning that and you're advancing past that, then it's like, okay, well, I can go into forensics. I yep. can go into incident response. I can go into pen testing and do all this mm -hmm. other stuff that builds on that other information. Yeah. Because you have a solid foundation already in a lot of the subject matter. So now, yeah, you can branch off. Yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. And then you get good at one thing and you're like, all right, I want to go this direction. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. And it's so funny because people ask me, like, are you blue team? Are you red team? Are you somewhere in the middle? I'm like, I think I'm all of it. I mean, I've been on solo pen test. I've been a part of large red <laughs> red team engagements. I've done some of the largest incident response engagements in, like, the modern time. Like, I, like it's been named already, like, named, like, my – so so when I worked for Mandiant, um, I don't know if you all knew or for those who are listening, Mandiant was the, the incident responding organization to the Colonial Pipeline incident. And as a part of that, right, having that ICS and OT background, I was one of the responders for that. So, you know, I've done, like, a lot of different things. So, you know, just like you mentioned it branching off into a lot of different areas i mean you just kind of let the <laughs> it's kind of weird but you let you almost let the threats define what your next thing is right the bad guys are almost defining on what you need to drill down into in order to really help to protect customers and people organizations from these upcoming compromises and vulnerabilities out there so yeah man so uh speaking of threats and uh crazy uh -oh. events <laughs> is there uh <laughs> Is there any stories that you can uh, you can share with us, even if you have to like you know uh, omit yeah. companies or anything? Listen, I have plenty, but let me <laughs> do this one. So the one, so I was on a red team engagement. So many times with, so even just staying with the ICS and OT cybersecurity, many times we are we would ride along with a lot of those traditional IT services. So kind of even a little bit more background. I've been a consultant for maybe. I don't know, five or so years, years now. Um, and when I say consultant, these are like front of the line type of engagement. So like customer facing. So let me take another step back. Organizations have cybersecurity needs that they don't have internal resources to fulfill. So many times they employ a consulting firm in order to come in and be able to help them address some of those things, whether it's strategic, whether it's programmatic, but many times even things like hands on the keyboard. So I've been a part of like red, red team engagements where organizations are bringing you in in order to say, hey, help us find our vulnerabilities, help us find our most vulnerable places before the bad guys find them. So I've been a part of red, a red team engagement that I remember that I was on and we were pretty much just all sitting down. And as an ICS OT specialist for that engagement, I was very much so focused on us going from the IT environment or IT enterprise environment into the OT environment. And this was a utility organization. So we were trying to tra see how the vulnerabilities would lead into OT and ICS. So we were just, you know, hacking away. It was probably like a team of five or six individuals hacking away, finding things, finding vulnerabilities. And all of a sudden, somebody gets some creds for a very high profile person within that organization. When I say high profile, this is the VP of finance of that organization. This is a super duper large company. Like they're everything, right? They're high up there. And all of a sudden when we, so as you're doing these red teams and pin tests, you have a point of contact within that organization where as you're making progress, you make sure to keep them informed, the customer informed of how much progress, what vulnerabilities you found and what impact it might have to the organization. Cause you're not just doing this willy nilly you're doing this almost like a supervised hack. So we tell a point of contact, hey, we got these creds, you know, it's for this person. Should we use these to proceed in order to find more vulnerabilities? Because that's one thing that you do, right? You find creds, you do certain things, and you move laterally, you elevate privileges to the point where you can display to that organization, hey, this is something that you all need to address with some security controls. But it didn't happen like that, right? What happened actually was that suits and all types of, let me tell you we were at a desk and all types of people came in was surrounding us and telling us stop you can't do anything else and they needed to address that you cannot like they needed to see what we did with those creds right for this vp of finance because i think they were going through some type of something financially within the organization so it was almost a stop halt like almost like they pulled our hands off the off our laptops and closed them Right. So that was a very interesting experience because, you know, that never happened before. Right. <laughs> so we would just not use the credits, but they were almost like, what did you do? What did you find? Did you look at emails? Did you do this? Did you do that? We were almost being interrogated throughout the engagement. So that was a very interesting experience. That was a very interesting experience. I can yep. imagine. I think uh, mm -hmm. a good lesson for everybody to just understand <laughs> is you need permission to do yep. certain things. <laughs> Absolutely. Even after you've 
you've re received permission, you need permission to proceed once you find something. You can't just go willy nilly. Many organizations, they have very sensitive things within the organizations that you need to continually be in communication with your point of contact and stick with your rules of engagements and your statement of work. So as a consultant, at, at least. So, yeah, man, that was that was mine. Yeah. Stop. That's what they <laughs> told us. <laughs> I, yep. just, I just picture you sitting mm -hmm. there at the keyboard just typing away and then yeah, all these people come in you're like what <laughs> looking around didn't know what, i didn't know what was going on <laughs> I you're like he did it he did it it was yeah because <laughs> we're passing the information all around right we got like a share like we're all like there's like a repository of all the stuff that we can do so we're all kind of going at it so but yeah no we had to stop so it was fun kind of fun afterwards right but it's a nice, makes for a nice story. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good war story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and throw this question up here that we got. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about learning and retaining all the information in these courses? I'm having trouble solidifying <laughs> the intricate details to memory. You shouldn't. I actually did a video on that. I don't know if you saw that one. It's to stop, the name of the video is to stop memorizing tech facts. I don't think people should memorize so many different tech facts because there's always something new to memorize. I think that um, what you should do is start to create like a repository of cheat sheets and notes and information that you can refer back to, right? So say for instance, you're learning, since we're talking about it, pen testing, right? You start putting down tools. You might say in-map. So these are my go-to in-map flags that I use. I don't think you should commit that to memory because that's just like almost information overload when you talk about the amount of flags that InMap has and contains. So I would say kind of take copious notes of the things that you do, and the information that you want to refer back to rather than try to memorize it all because that can just be too much for any human brain. But I'll pass it to you, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I think yeah. that, um, you know, there, there's two sides of the equation here. So you have mm -hmm. your certification exam, which you're probably asking uh, about. Okay. And then you have real life. Um, you know, obviously when you're in your job or, you know, at work, you can Google, you can, you know, do all these things, you can look stuff up. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of two different sides of the equation. Um, a lot of times the certification exams, you know, it's a lot of them are fact-based depending on which certification exam it is. So, you know, you're going to have to do things like your flashcards and your, um, just practicing that memorization of them. And then mm -hmm. when you finish those certification exams, you probably are going to, you know, misplace a lot of that information. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you're, when you're in real life, you don't need to have all that stored up. So you can replace that memory space with other information. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've ever taken any of the, uh, the GIAC certifications, I know you have. <laughs> but, it's too, too many. But, but uh, but, um, you know, you get to make an index and it's much more real world because you get to reference that index just like if you had a book or something in the mm -hmm. real world. And so you don't have to necessarily retain all that information. You just have to know from a high level or uh, to a certain extent, you know, those tools or those commands or, you know, what it does. And then you kind of put the pieces together. I think that's much more um, accurate to how you would operate at your job than you would, you know, on a, just a memorization certification exam. Mm -hmm. so, I awesome agree. Question. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see here. Uh oh, the big dogs in here. Grant Collins. What's up, Grant? Oh, uh, yep, yep. <laughs> yep. Saw that come through. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Let me look at my other questions and keep throwing your questions in the, uh, the chat as well. But, um, throw that up there. I'm happy it could be uh, helpful to you for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, prior to getting into YouTube and doing all this stuff where you're starting to be a, a name, a household name, you know, what was your uh, online? Household? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I got you. <laughs> what, 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 uh, what was your online presence like? Um, were mm -hmm. you doing much as far as like uh, putting out blogs or, you know, what, what was that like before? I think my online presence primarily consisted of LinkedIn and Twitter. So I don't know if you all are familiar with InfoSec Twitter. It can be a great place, but it can also be a not so great, great place. There is there is many times people when people release tools, 
um, things like things on their GitHub accounts. Many times they first post them to Twitter, right? So that could be someplace. Or if a company just got hacked or something and there's some indicators of compromise or some hashes or some IP addresses, a lot of times that's released on Twitter first. But there's also some places, some things on InfoSec Twitter where people are kind of going back and forth and beefing. Yeah. So, but I am on Twitter, right? InfoSec Twitter under um, ICS underscore Gabe and also LinkedIn. And I've also spoken at many conferences. So spoken at these SANS conferences. So they have these um, ICS summits, right? Industrial control system summits that SANS has. So I've spoken at those. They post them to, to YouTube. So there are, like, if you put my name in, like my first and last name, there's plenty of talks that I have on, on there. So that was the, the primarily how I was on um, the internet or digital footprint career-wise online. So, yep. Okay. So as you've, you know, started to the, do the YouTube stuff, have you, um, I don't know if you've gone to, like, any events or anything, you know, since mm -hmm. all the stuff that's happened the last couple of years but as i yeah. started to come back you know have you started to notice that some of these people that have been in the industry or that have uh, maybe crossed paths with you are starting to recognize you more or um you know see some of this stuff so i haven't been to a conference yet since i've spoken at some but they've all been digital right so i've seen like at some people would at, at at me on twitter or post another one of my videos on linkedin or something um, but I think the way that I primarily seen that, you know, after doing content creation is through interviews. Right. So I've interviewed. It, 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 I'm always like inter like interviewing here and there to try to gain an understanding of like different opportunities. Um, so literally interviewers would be like, oh, I saw your YouTube channel. I'm like, oh, you saw my YouTube channel. And they were asked the same type of questions you're asking. Like, how did you get get like, how did you get started? What was this like? So I think that's been the pri primary way that I've seen it is that. Um, people have seen me online and hiring managers have seen me online. So it's been very interesting. It's been very interesting trans transition. So, yep. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely interesting when you have people that you've never talked to before and Ever. never gave them a link or anything. And they're like, yeah, like I, I saw you like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and also, like I mentioned at, at my firm, I'm a, I'm a manager. So I interview all the time. So actually someone who I was interviewing, um, knew me like knew my name and knew my channel and all that i felt i felt kind of like embarrassed or, or something i was like because yeah, it was like it's very new she was like yeah i saw a lot of your videos and you know i'm very encouraged by the interview and i'm like all right all right yeah yeah let's do it. so that was that was something that was very interesting to me too yeah yeah i think it um Especially initially, it's kind of mm -hmm. weird. Um, yeah. You know, just like when you're first starting a channel or anything like that, you're starting to put up content. It's like, it's a it's a weird feeling. Yeah. And then as you start to get traction and people start to know who you are or mm -hmm. um, you know recognize your content or anything like that, it just it's like okay, this is yeah. like starting to be normal. It's not as weird yeah. as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess depending on what they say, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it kind of really makes you. I think it does set set you apart, right? Because I don't think I don't care what industry you're in, whether it's YouTube, whether it's work, there's always some level of competition, right? And I think that for those who may be newer or try to understand how to distinguish yourself as a, a security practitioner, I think content creation is a great way to do that, right? Organizations see you. Um, your boss sees you maybe some, 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 sometimes and the world sees you. So I think that it really helps to distinguish you. It makes you stand out from other practitioners. So in the in this competitive security world, even though there's like so many security jobs. Um, so yeah, I think it does help to distinguish you as a practitioner. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember when I um, was interviewing for some jobs, I actually was asked a couple of times, you know, how mm -hmm. are you contributing to the industry or mm. are you contributing to like open source projects or, you know, what are you doing? And yeah. this was, of course, before um, I started doing YouTube. Okay. But I think that, you know, kind of um, kind of turned on the light, you know, as far as, okay, I need to do something because apparently everybody mm -hmm. is doing this or people are doing <laughs> this because yeah. I'm getting asked about it. And if they're not all doing it and then I'm going to do it, then I'll stand out even more. Yep. Um, and, you know, one of the pieces of advice that I always give people is, you know, look for ways that you can stand out. Mm -hmm. do uh, blogs, do videos, do something, uh, mm -hmm. get on LinkedIn and try to network with people because, 
you know it it's a crowd it's a crowded space right now not really yeah. but um yeah you know as uh as more people start to get into this field and we start to have less of a shortage of job opportunities mm -hmm. you know how are you going to stand out from everybody else Absolutely. if nobody's doing stuff then like you're all going to look the same and then how mm -hmm. do they pick the how do they pick the best people or the people that yeah. they want to want to work with so yeah i think some of that is even happening now right i think that many times and it's not bad advice right but Security Plus is typically the cert, right? The cybersecurity cert for entry level roles. But right now, I'm, I feel like everybody's getting Security Plus, right? So it's almost becoming a cert that's not distinct, that doesn't distinguish you from other candidates, right? Are you doing labs? Are you blogging? Are you doing content creation? I just to your same point, I think that that is something that helps to distinguish you even more. But just a cert, I don't, I don't think is it. It's not enough anymore, right? Because it's, it's, it's. You know, everybody's getting it. So, yeah, just thinking about that is important. Yeah. And especially if you want to get like the really good jobs too. like yeah. you have to, you know, really be willing to go a little bit above and beyond mm -hmm. um, than just getting a certification, getting a security plus. I mean, that's great from a, a knowledge standpoint, because that does give you knowledge. And I still recommend the security plus and the certifications cool. in general. But um you know, it, it shows that further interest that a lot of people aren't doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to so many people like coach them and uh, mentor yeah. them. And, you know, I, I tell people, you have to do some of this stuff. You have to go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of find where you want to contribute uh, because you don't have to do it all. You just no. have to try to find something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people still don't always do it. And no. I mean, that's a choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, it definitely takes time, right? Like depending on which one you're going to do, some will take more time than others. I mean, YouTube mm -hmm. takes time. It, it is, does. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely more time than uh, hopping on LinkedIn and throwing up a blog post or something. Yep. But, um, you know, there, there are skills that you can show with all of that. And you just kind of have to pick and choose, you know, with what your lifestyle and, you know, time allows for. Mm -hmm. And I guess interest too, because... Some people don't want to make videos, but no, a lot of people don't. A lot of people yeah. just, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's throw this question up here. So, what are your thoughts on federal government versus commercial clients? Hmm. So, so I kind of like the commercial clients a little bit more. Um, it tends to be the work is tends to be more interesting from a consulting perspective. I'm not saying it's bad on the government side, but the government side it tends to be a bit more you know, regimented, um, a lot more meetings. Everybody's, it's like 50 million meetings to get one little change made. And it makes sense, right? You have to go through so much more stringency or stringent process when you're talking about cybersecurity within government systems and environments, right? Stigs and scaps and all this stuff, right? But um, I like commercial clients a bit more because you can actually get a little bit more creative in the, in the services that you do and kind of really helping organizations to build many times there's their security program from the bottom up, because especially when you're talking about ICS and OT security, many of these environments, like I, I remember one of my first engagements um, was at a, a lumber company who made um, paper and plywood. They made all types of, of, of wood products and they didn't have a cybersecurity program whatsoever. It just didn't exist. And I think that um, with that commercial client, you're able to help them along the way. And it's almost like you're teaching too at the same time. So I like the commercial because you can get a bit more creative in the services that you provide to, to customers in comparison to federal government where it's like, right, NIST uh, 853, got to go through that process and meetings and sticking and scaffing. And it's just pretty, um, pretty standard in comparison. So that's how I'd answer that. Black Ops, he's always throwing government uh -huh. stuff at me. <laughs> so would you say that yeah. it is, um, and, and this is kind of my opinion creeping in here too, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, with like the commercial clients versus like the federal government, there's a difference in just the overall maturity of how a lot of these programs are built yeah. and the requirements that are there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. It also depends, right? Because some organizations are very mature, even more mature, like on the, on the commercial slide. 
even more mature. Like they have the latest and greatest stuff in in play. Like I've like we've recently got a question from a customer to say, what does world or best in class? What does a best in class cybersecurity program look like, right? For ICS and OT security. And it's like me and other peers within the organization, we were, we were throwing so many different ideas out there about automating processes, having redundancy and resources, having different uh, applications and tools in, in place, having an incident response retainer in the event that an organization got compromised. We were just kind of throwing so many things in place where on the government side, it's, it's kind of like, it's already structured, right? It's already there. You already know what you got to do. But on that commercial side, we were able to kind of throw way more ideas of what we've seen as a whole from the industry. So um, maturity varies, yeah. but um, I just I, I just feel more loose when I'm with a commercial yeah, client. There's less restrictions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, way less sure. restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's see, let's do this next one up here. So, what's the main things that I should focus on to be competent enough to pass uh, any uh, my CompTIA Plus exam? I think definitely uh, starting off there with the syllabus, right? They have all the subjects and the information, whether it's antivirus, whether it's networking, whether it's hardening, whether it's uh, the CIA triad, how we mentioned before, very much so focusing in on a lot of that foundational cybersecurity information provided in the Security Plus syllabus. And then starting to really put your hands to the keyboard to see if you can try out some of those uh, exercises and projects. I think that that's, that's well enough to be able to pass the CompTIA I believe CompTIA, I'm thinking Security Plus is what they're mentioning here. Um, yeah, but yeah, starting off with the syllabus for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as far as the CompTIA exams, you know, there's still that traditional kind of memorization kind of certification exams. Mm -hmm. You know, the performance-based questions are still, you know, it, you're not going to get thrown into some Cisco configuration and have to like do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it, Definitely get the the concepts and all that good stuff down, and it should be pretty, pretty solid, I think. Oh, you talk about the old school CCNA. I got mine the CCNA back in 2017, and who configuring chunk ports and implementing port security and every oh man, I yeah. was friends with Packet Tracer. <laughs> I was very good good friends with that. <laughs> yeah, I got my uh, CCNA back in. Well, I had two. I had so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've gone through so many changes as well. Even I now. had, uh, mm -hmm. let's see, 2013, I got okay. my CSENT and my CCNA and route switch because they mm -hmm. had broken it up into different paths. So yep. there was like Same. six different CCNAs. And then I got the uh, security uh, CCNA as well. Okay. And then yeah. I let them expire because I never use them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and so mine was in 2016, 2017. I'll get the CCNA. Uh, C CSENT, just like yours, right? The ICND one and the ICND two was yeah. the full CCNA. And then they were giving away Cisco Cyber Ops, right? CCNA yeah. Cyber Ops for free, pretty much for anybody who I think yeah. has CCNAs. So I so I went through that program and got the Cyber Ops. So yeah, very similar. But now it's one big old exam and you can even, I think you don't even have to have a CCNA to skip the CCMP anymore. I yeah, think that you can just go straight weird. to CCMP. Yeah, it's different. And, and they have very, like, a, I forget what it's called, but they have like a CSENT-esque kind of certification. Really? It's like the the technician one. They've opened that up into more of yeah. like the CSENT style. I, it's I hard to follow, man. It's really hard to follow because I was even looking at renewing my CCNA and I end up not because it was just so confusing on how to renew it <laughs> like it's just yeah. not straightforward it's not straightforward at all i'm like yeah it's cool i got the yeah. knowledge <laughs> yep exactly yeah. mm -hmm. let's see here all right let's throw this one up here so for me primarily i'm a visual learner i connect more with the video contents that shows a step-by-step -step process on any topic which helps me do most of the uh hands-on training nice. so what nice. uh what kind of learner are you do you like hands-on learning oh. do you like videos I'm a little bit of it all, right? So I think that a lot of times I'll listen to videos to get a high level understanding of things. But then I do like to lab up, start to do exercises. Like I know I'm really trying to get a bit more into my Python programming. So I need exercises. I, I, I can't listen to another video on Python in order to help me. Like I know my functions, I know variables, loops and all that. That's, I need to be able to put it into practice. So I think I'm a little bit of it all, honestly. Yep. 
Yeah, same. I mean, definitely as you get more mm -hmm. um, technical or more into specific technologies, you know, having those hands-on labs is huge because yeah. a lot of that is just, you need that reinforcement on how to configure something or how to uh, write a function or a loop or something. Mm -hmm. And if you're just doing it, you know, theoretically or conceptually, yeah. it's very hard to solidify that information. Yep. Yep. And I literally have a whole folder of things that, it's like I was mentioning before, having a repository of stuff I can refer back to so that I don't have to memorize it because I think going back to it after I haven't learned it or went through it in a while, it helps to reaffirm those, those, uh, those, those concepts. So yeah, I just keep a lot of cheat sheets and information and scripts and things that I've written before oh. to help me. Yeah. And a good lesson there too is take good notes because yeah. you never know when you're going to have to go back and look at them and remember what you wrote. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see here. Let's throw this one up here. All right. So where can we get hands-on training for ICS? Just joining the stream. I think we kind of went over this uh, earlier. A but little if you bit. Wanna... Yeah. So there are, so there are a couple of resources, right? But they're typically paid. Right. And that's the thing that I don't like the most. And they're not only just a little pay, they're like thousands of dollars to get a certain training class. So Mandiant Fire, well, now Mandiant just, they have a training class called the ICS Fundamentals class or ICS um, Security Fundamentals. And that's, I think, several thousand dollars. And then SANS has several ICS OT cybersecurity classes. Those are uh, seven, eight thousand dollars per exam or per sitting. So I think that if you can get your organization to pay for it and they see value in it, um, I think that that'll, those are very good, good ways to go. But I'm actually like, that's actually something that I'm planning on doing. I'm actually planning on making a, like a Udemy class for like introductory introduction. It's, it's going to be called the um, introduction or absolute introduction to ICS and OT cybersecurity. Right. And it's not going to be even half as much as those exams are. And I think that that'll be something to really help out with. But that's really where those trainings are right now. It's not a lot of free free training resources. So, or right, YouTube. Everybody, YouTube everybody you heard it here first. He's doing a uh -oh. course. I am. <laughs> I'm doing a course. Absolutely. <laughs> and Kev and Kev Tech told told me to make make a course. So that's again towards the thing of people pushing me to do to do stuff positive things. Of course, people pushing me to do positive things. So you know, uh, Kev. I came from Kev Tech. He told me to make a course when he was interviewing me. So. Yep. Yeah, cor courses are definitely <laughs> a good way to um, to give back to you know a lot of people, especially depending on what yeah. you you know you make it in. Um, if anybody has not made a course before, they take a while, depending on how much you've uh, yes. you know you put into it. Definitely more than like YouTube videos. So mm -hmm. uh, go sign up for the course when it is up because absolutely it's a lot of effort into it. And there's also I do have there's a little fun little uh, thing. So there's a hands-on thing that you can use. So you can use like you can use Kali Linux, and then you can use some ICS OT products. I'm gonna throw it. Well, here I'll throw it in the back chat. That might give this person a little bit of uh, taste of what it's like. So it's actually utilizing a, a particular type of protocol in ICS and OT security. It's called Mod Modbus, right? This is one of those programs or, or one of those protocols that talks to PLCs and different industrial things, right? So. That's a that's like a kind of like a tutorial that uh, John is going to post or maybe in the in the description section later I that can give too, you. Yeah. Oh, OK, perfect. That can give you some hands on ex experience. So that'll give you a little bit of a taste um, until my Udemy class is ready. So. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I don't uh, mm -hmm. I mean, kind of like we talked about earlier, I don't think I've seen any any kind of courses like that come up or anything. There aren't so any. There are some on Udemy way. like they're high level. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, I gotta see. <laughs> yeah. Everybody will yeah. sign up cause they hear, they heard it here, heard it let's, here first. <laughs> let's go. Yes. Yes. I'm with it. So, uh, I saw that you had on your LinkedIn, you had a bunch of, um, uh, bunch of certifications. So what, <sighs> what, what would you say has been your favorite so far? Oh, let's see. I guess, first of all, what, which certifications do you have? So everybody knows. Too many, too many <laughs> certifications. So I have. Let me start from the beginning because I think I can re remember them. So I had, so like we were mentioning, like the CSENT and then the CCNA, right? Routing, routing and switching. Then I have a CEH, a certified ethical hacker um, certification. Then I have a GSLC, that's a GX security leadership cert. 
Then I have a GNFA, which is a GIAC Network Forensics Analyst. Then I have a GICSP, a GIAC um, ICS Security one. And I have a GCIH, which is GIAC Certified Incident Handler. And I have a GRID, <laughs> it's GIAC Response and Incident Detection. And then do I have any more? I think that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Too many. I have too many. It's, it's too, it's, it's what, don't be like me, right? Don't be like me. <laughs> no. I wouldn't say don't be like me, but I would say like get, Organiz so many of those certifications have been organizational driven, right? So organization, so I've never paid for a certification, never paid out of pocket for any of these certifications. So there, so many of those certifications has come from a need from the organization I was working for and they pay for it. They pay for me to get it. So that's a good thing, but I am pretty much certed out, man. I don't want to get any more certs at this point. Maybe a couple were here there, but not a lot, but um. I didn't hear yeah. any cloud ones in there, so I don't have any room. cloud ones yet. No, I have zero cloud. See, that's what I'm saying, right? You know, AWS and Azure and GCP. Yeah. Which certification path mm -hmm. am I going down next? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I got I have a, a few, uh, a few mm -hmm. GIAC ones too, right? There. Yeah. The GSEC, uh, the GCIH, yep. and the GWAP. So mm. uh, speaking of struggle, I failed the GSEC the first time I took it. I yeah. failed it. That's why I don't have it. Right. And I think that that's normal. Right. I think that and that's one of the purposes of my channel. Right. We like I, the GSEC was the first ever IT security certification I'd, I'd ever taken. I was maybe two years out of college and I had no introduction to IT administration, nothing. So I think that those type of stories like failing tests and failing exams, I'm not saying it's the most preferred, but it's something that I went through in order to get to where I'm at now. Right. I have five of those now. I failed the first one and I have five of those later, right? So I think that um, that's 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 something that I definitely promote is that the struggle is real and the struggle is okay. And it's normal. The struggle is normal. So, yeah. <laughs> And sure. I think too, um, you know, certification exams in general, because I, mm -hmm. uh, my CCNA security, I failed it twice, I think. Yeah. Because you had to basically be perfect in order to pass oh, it. Oh, easily. Like, oh, man. That's, that's why I didn't go to CCNA security because I'm yeah. like, yeah. Like, I don't know all these firewalls. It was, it, it felt like a Cisco firewall exam. And I'm like, yeah. It, good. And yeah. I found that like, just as you kind of get more or like you, you know, get more experience, you find out how you learn best, what the mm -hmm. things are you need to do to prepare. And, um, you know, just the whole process becomes easier, I guess, unless you're going for the OSCP, then it's, just, oh you know, my gosh. <laughs> but, but people, listen, people fail to OSCP three, four, five different times. Yeah. I mean, before they have a successful pass, right? So struggle is there too, right? Yeah. And for the people that don't know what the OSCP is, it's like the premier um, penetration testing certification exam, 24-hour exam. You have to pack into boxes. You have to write a re report in order to, to pass it. So it's intense and it's your, it's your choice. <laughs> it's your choice if you want to go down that route. So. Yep, I, I have definitely felt that pain of being close on that one. And I was well, like, mm. yeah. But yeah, it is yeah, what man. it is. <laughs> I, I was studying for it some years ago. And as I was going through some of the boxes, I'm just like, this is, I literally have to take time off. I had to take time off from work in order to solidify some of the concepts in order to really hack into some of those boxes. Because it's, it's very, like the guide doesn't, and that's a whole whole other thing. It could be a yeah. different guy now, but the guy didn't at that time go into depth about certain concepts. So I was I had to fill in the blanks with Googling. Like I was just a Google master when I was studying for it. So yeah, it's difficult. That's that's a difficult one. I haven't seen the uh, the newest guide, but um, mm -hmm. since they put Active Directory and stuff in there, but yeah. supposedly it's gotten better. I mean, it, yeah. it was always that whole thing where it's like, well, try harder. It's like what? Oh, like. <laughs> Yeah, I will try harder at the expense of my mental health, man. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go crazy here. I really think that there are great resources out, out there for pen testing. Try Hack Me is great. I don't know if you've, you've, you've been promoting that or said anything about that, but Try Hack Me is great for really going step by step on concepts, even as it concerns Active Directory cybersecurity, Active Directory pen testing. They have modules that literally step you through. They give you a, a, a virtual machine to hack. And it's like, it's really helpful to go through the steps 
rather than being thrown everything and given the fire hydrant to drink to drink from in order to understand some of the concepts. So that's one thing that I heavily promote for blue team and red team, right? So it, yeah. it, it does has defensive things in it too. So yeah, man. Yeah, I like try hack me definitely better than uh, hack the box because I've yeah. done both and just um, and I know that hack the box is kind of. They're starting to evolve some of their training because it used mm -hmm. to just be, you know, straight CTF kind of stuff, similar yeah. to the OSCP. And uh, Try Hack Me, just from the start, has really been uh, much oh. more tutorial kind of based. And it's just, to me, it's a more enjoyable learning experience. Yes. Especially because if you don't know, you know, what's going on, it's very difficult to just like mm -hmm. pull it out of your hat and <laughs> like, got it. <laughs> like, what? And and it's like that was the expectation, right? A lot of times in those early, right? Everybody was jumping into pen testing and hacking. That was the expectation that you somehow figure it out with some exploit that you found on exploit DB that you modify the C program. It was just, I just don't think that that's that's the best way to learn. So yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have so much to say about that, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put that off for another, uh, yeah, another interview. We'll put that on the side. Yep. Uh, so we got a comment. I have to say that you guys are truly inspiring mm -hmm. and are helping me so much to understand so many aspects of this crazy tech lifestyle. Listen, I'm happy we could be of service to you, man. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's what it's all about is helping, mm -hmm. helping people that need the help. So, yeah. So, um, we are just over an hour, but I want to mm -hmm. go ahead and uh, kind of wrap it up with, yeah. you know, one big final question is just what would the biggest one to two pieces of advice be that you would give somebody that's trying to build their career in cybersecurity? Hmm. Let's see. I think, okay, the first one is. I think that many times in cybersecurity, we focus so much on having those technical skills. Can we do it? Can we hack the thing? Can we write the YARL rule? Can we do this? Do we know this, this tool? Um, I think technical skills are great, but even greater than technical skills are is resourcefulness, right? And when I say resourcefulness, I mean that when you don't know something, it's important to know or to find out where to go in order to get that information. So knowing people, knowing websites and processes, understanding general concepts, but then being able to build upon that, right? So I think that the advice is to not focus so much on the technical skills, but focus on your network, focus on resourcefulness, and focus on how to find the answer to a problem when you don't know the problem. I think that that's, that's something that's very important. So that a that's my advice. I'll leave that one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great piece of advice. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that is very hard to conceptualize when you first kind of start out is that you're not going to know everything. Nope. You're not going to remember everything that you've learned. Nope. <laughs> and <laughs> just being able to kind of, uh, you know, put the pieces together, know con uh, concepts, how things work together, where to go mm -hmm. to find your answers or who to talk to, all that stuff matters. And, um, you know, use your resources, rely on your resources and the knowledge that you've gained and the experience. And, yeah. you know, ultimately you'll, you'll get to the answer. Absolutely. And, uh, and especially like if you're interviewing or something like that, you know, don't be afraid to say you don't know yeah. or you know where to go because that looks a whole lot better than just trying to fabricate some answer that yep. you, you know. Let me tell you a, a psychological trick that I do every time. Sometimes I write things down, but most of the time I don't. I'll literally be in the interview and I'll be writing down things as the interviewer is speaking. Sometimes it's something super duper valuable, but I make sure to at least make it seem like I'm writing things down. But if you don't know something, it's important to write those things, things down. But I would say anytime in an interview, bring a notebook, a piece of paper uh, or a pen, paper or a pen or pencil and start writing things, things down. But I think it does at times psychologically um, hack hack the interviewer's mind too so yeah that. and that that way you have uh questions or something like if you don't know something you can go yep. back and look at it and try to figure it out you'll get better at interviewing by doing that absolutely so. or you're writing down the name of the interviewer right knowing yes. the name of that person connecting with them on linkedin later or just something along those those lines or even the problem that that they're having right this is a problem or whatever and then you'll be able to research and learn more about hey maybe 
if I didn't get that job, I might be able to implement that somewhere else. Right. So yeah. Yes. All absolutely. That. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Um, so uh, let's see here. So that, let me just look at the questions, make sure we don't got any left. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, cool. So uh, awesome interview, extremely Thanks. grateful for you to show up Gabriel and come on the channel and help people get a little bit more familiar with the ICS, OT, cybersecurity side yep. of things. And hopefully we've answered everybody's questions. Uh, check out the description because I have included uh, his social stuff in the description, uh, his struggle security on YouTube. So go check out the channel, uh, hit him up on LinkedIn, connect with them. Maybe he's got some jobs. I don't know. I, I think I do. I think I there do. You go. Yeah, hit me up. <laughs> there you go. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, uh, Gabe, if you want to hang out uh, for a second and sure. we'll wrap up. But everybody else, thanks for joining us. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later. All right. See you all later.